Hey everybody, this is Ben Atkinson and this is our interview series, Inspire, Inspiring Le Leadership. And it's actually our final interview of the series. Um, and uh, this week we are interviewing a good friend of mine who's been um, the host of the uh, the series for most, but most of this year. Um, he's a leadership coach. And one second, my... <laughs> That's a good start. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good start. Something else was playing in my ear then. Um, so he's, he's a leadership coach to CEOs and teams. Um, he's actually got a, his own podcast, which is in the top 2% worldwide. Um, he's a motivational speaker, ex-army officer, um, and a thoroughly nice gentleman. It's uh, Jonathan Bowman Perks. Welcome, Jonathan. Thanks, Ben, and uh, great to be with you. And just so those who are listening, this is our last live session uh, today. But the, um, I'll continue to be doing two podcasts a week, two videos a week. It'll be on my website, uh, jonathanperks.com, and also it'll be on YouTube and LinkedIn. So while Ben and I won't be doing this again, we, Ben has been uh, snapped up by Amazon Web Services, and he's doing very well there. But um, we're going to um, not do live, but we are going to be doing podcasts. But uh, it's great to be with you, Ben, and thank you for, for you being the host and me being the guest. Good stuff. And anyone listening, do um, ask questions. We're going to be talking about um, leadership and, and all the sort of lessons which Jonathan has learned along his um, illustrious career. So let's let's get started. Let's talk about um, your your journey, Jonathan. So um, your sort of career journey and what what sort of got you to what you're doing now. Yeah, illustrious career. I'm not quite sure. It, it, <laughs> it's very kind. Of, it's Too modest. Many of the people who are listening and there's some good friends and some clients and people that I serve with. Well, no, I probably made way more blunders than they've ever made, but I learned a lot from it. I think I'm a, I'm a quick learner from my mistakes, and that's why I've learned so much. <laughs> I've made so many. Yeah, I think it all, the, the earliest memory is really a, a bleak Scottish airfield with the sleeting rain coming down in Lossiemouth. And, um, yeah, we were in a, a caravan, and um, my parents, young 35-year-olds, very much in love. It's a very caring family environment. But um, yeah, that, that day when the, the naval officer, the um, casualty visiting officer, knocked on the door and told my mother, who's terribly sorry, but that her husband had been killed while uh, flying on operations in Changi uh, over in Indonesia or near Indonesia in Singapore. And really from that moment, everything changed. Um, he was 35 when he was killed. I was just three, two brothers um, who were, uh, four four and six years older than me but it was a, a real shock and then I think from from that um, mother tried to give me some experience of a male environment so she sent me to boarding school luckily in, in my house we didn't have the abusive paedophile who was in the next boarding house who uh, did and told devastation to poor children there but um, I just struggled a bit at boarding school um, I, I was told by my teacher in junior school before I went to boarding school, uh, she was very uh, optimistic about my future. She said I was thick uh, and I was stupid and I was going to be a dustman unless I worked harder. Oh, so you <laughs> need teachers these days, like my daughter Harriet, um, to realize that's not the way to motivate children. But my mother did say, don't worry, you know, we'll find something else for you to do. If it, if it isn't maths and it isn't English, we'll find something else for you to do. Um, and uh, it, it wasn't diagnosed at the time, but later on, I think probably I only did the test the other day, but I've sort of wondered for some time. Turns out I was neurodiverse, which is the nice term to say I was dyslexic. Um, but then if, if Richard Branson can be dyslexic and make a fist of things, I, I think I've, I've found other ways to cope. Um, and although I've written sort of three books, um, I tend to dictate things and I, I listen a lot to to audio books, which is one of the greatest sort of learnings I've had. Um, but then uh, from growing up in Halifax in Yorkshire and uh, going up the, the moor in sleeting snow and bleak rain, and that was in the summer, um, I sort of used it from Scotland. Um, I, I, I went to uh, Welbeck College and then into the army. Um, and I had to go into the technical cause, uh, but Santos was the making of me. I, I found lots of friends and we've had it. We, we were due to have our 40 year reunion this next year, but I think we're not gonna get together with COVID, but some great friends, uh, Errol Stewart, Rod Thomas, uh, to, to name uh, but a few, 
and they've, they've gone on and done a whole variety of different things. And, and it was at Sanders that I did the long distance running. So that was that was the thing that I, I was at school, not only was I kindly described as being thick, but I also was uncoordinated. So if you've ever been, when those games where they choose the kids on the touchline and you, my team, you, my team, and so on, I was always the one at the end that they didn't choose because they knew I'd sort of kick and miss or wouldn't hit the cricket ball. So um, I, I sort of had a, a lack of confidence to begin with, and it took me quite a lot of time to build build it. But Santos was the building of me, and and I found that I wasn't I wasn't out of place. I'd found people who were like me, uh, whatever country they come from, like Himalaya Tapper from Nepal and Anwar from Jordan and Jeffrey Bostick from um, Barbados, and and my best man when I got married five and a half years ago, Errol Stewart from Jamaica. Uh, and then lots of good good friends from the English regiments. Um, but yeah, running was my big thing. And then uh, during my time in the army, uh, began 10 years in the Royal Signals. Uh, and then I loved the infantry side so much that I managed to get to join my own Yorkshire regiment, the Green Howards, now called the Yorkshire Regiment. And during that time I did Air Mobile and we flew in helicopters and drove the, the SES's light strike vehicles, which were great fun. I did the airborne training with P Company and got my, my wings uh, training with them. Um, and then did armoured infantry in the warrior fighting vehicle in Bosnia, went to Ireland. Uh, I was in electronic warfare. I was a spy, I think would be described, working for GCHQ. Uh, and then went to Staff College where I had a reunion recently and um, met a lot of old friends who I hadn't seen for years, which is why I started to do the podcast series because they, while I was just a, a past ever major and left the army as a major, They'd gone on to generals or you know successful in business, and I, I, I sort of reached out to them, got them to tell their stories, and and that's really how this became a top two percent of global podcasts because of them, not because of me. Um, and then did the MBA while I was still in the army. Uh, I went for the army to work for the army management consultants. They said this was not a good career move. I said no, no, I do. It is a good career move. It's just they didn't know what my career plans were, and and so then. Uh, PwC kindly took me on and um, I really enjoyed that but then we got bought by IBM which was a bit of a, uh, a, a deal I hadn't planned on I, I, I was really keen to be in PwC not so keen on IBM so I uh, did one move and then ended up uh, in Penner um, which was a PLC as a managing director eventually um, I think did about six to eight years there learned a lot about board executive coaching uh, and that was really uh, great. And then one of my clients said, look, we're not hiring Penner, we're hiring you. Why don't you go on your own? Oh, I can't go on my own. I, I'd be an utter failure. I just, I don't know. I've always been institutionalized from the army onwards, from sporting school onwards. But actually it was the making of me. Uh, and while there's been times when you think, crikey, how am I going to get through financially this year? There's been some great times as well. And, and while it's tough at the moment in the recession, there's no doubt our industry has been hard hit. You know, we will get through somehow. Mm -hmm. and, pivot and learn so yeah that's a bit yeah. of my my story Ben excellent and um and obviously the army's been a real sort of formative time for you I know that over the over the period that we've done these interviews and we've interviewed all these people different people from from um from your army um in experience um that time at Sandhurst and and, and the, the time in the army what was some of the really sort of big learnings that you took away from that that have really sort of um really sort of helped you through through uh, your, your career. Yeah, uh, it's, it's kind of you to, to say that. Uh, I think I saw some really good leaders. Um, mm. Some that have been on the series. Dave Hudson, I'll mention later, Tim Evans, uh, James Bashel, uh, Dave and um, Dave Hudson and James and I all did P Company, the Airborne Training together. And, and it was a bond that we've never lost mm. um, from all that time. So. It's, it's the fact that you're prepared, literally prepared to die for people, like my father died for, for those he served with. Um, you would be prepared to do it for these people. and But also you do get some, as, as the Australians would describe, heels um, in the army too, who are pretty unpleasant, unsavory characters and ruthlessly ambitious and narcissistic personality disorders like Donald Trump. Um, they normally get found out, but some of them get through uh, and, and get on to high rank. Um, but generally not. So so I think learning a lot from them and having lost my father when I was three and not having a male role model, I, I think I was constantly looking for one, which is why I probably carried on studying human behavior, looking for good men and women who are good leaders. 
that having having trying to find someone, perhaps it's the, the hero complex, not for me, but trying to find people that I would admire and respect. Mm. You've got to be careful with that because you can get a bit a bit too idealistic. But I think that's what what I learned a lot. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and and one thing I, I I was curious about you you got awarded an MBE. It, I'd I'd love to know know more about that. What what was that for? Yeah, was it MBE my bloody effort and OBE's other buggers efforts? Um, but I think in this one it actually was a great team that I had when I was chief of staff of, of fifteen brigade, which is a a big brigade in the northeast. Um, uh, we got asked to go to Australia and help the Australians uh, prepare for the East Timor operation where they stopped the um, the militias who were uh, raping, murdering, massacring people in East Timor. And it, it went very well. But that was because we had a really good team together. Um, so I think that time when I was chief of staff there was far better than when I was chief of staff at Staff College where I had a, a team of very capable people um, and, but they're all large characters like Tim Collins, who I've interviewed as well, and various others who've all gone on to, to great things. And many of them ended up as generals and trying to herd that group of cats together with more than I was capable of. So it was pretty average when I when I did it at Staff College. But this time around, I'd learned and realized that you find the talent in the people, you know, surround yourself with an army of giants, people are metaphorically taller than you, and you'll never work a day in your life. Your, your just job is to bring the best out in them. And and that's why I went to see uh, the Queen at the palace and, and get the MBE for, for my time as chief of staff for, I think, four years I did, rather than just two. Yeah, it, and I think it probably takes takes a bit of internal confidence to be able to to, to, to do that, to, to hire, to hire and, and and have teams of giants around you. I think, think that that's a mistake that people make. Yeah, yeah. You're, yeah. You're, you're spot on. They, they think that they want to be challenged. Mm. Uh, had a, a commanding officer at one stage and he didn't like the lab alone the company commanders didn't like us to challenge him he was the king he had to be the best and the soldiers yeah. loved him, but he literally went out of his way to unhinge and disrupt his direct reports so there could be no challenge to him and his status and and it was a very psychologically not safe place at all uh, yeah. very unhappy time whereas good commanding officers like i worked for richard dannett lord dannett as he is now he would bring us all on and we would just be given our head. Uh, he was a very fine leader. I learned so much from Yeah, yeah. So the MBE must have been a hugely proud moment for you. Um, and it'd be nice to know what, what were other, uh, another proud moment in your life and, and any, any dark times um, and what you sort of learned from them. Yeah, um, I think, um, yeah, proud moments. I think but my, my two daughters, Harris and Brownie, they're, their births and and some of their successes in life when they were you know, head girl at their school or both of them um, got first class honours degrees one at Bristol and one at Cambridge uh, and they're, they're both emotionally intelligent seeing them go on one's working at Ocado uh, in their strategy M&A uh, and the other one's just going to um, start in a tech company called and digital uh, having been a teacher for for five years and so going to the learning development side so very proud of them Another proud moment is marrying Lee, my, my wife, um, in Jamaica five and a half years ago and, and seeing her set up a charity for vulnerable girls, the Inspiring Leadership Trust. I'm very, very proud of the huge commitment she does on top of her coaching and her leadership work. That The evenings and weekends, she's helping people who are far more vulnerable. And as you can imagine, in this time of lockdown, the abusers are in the same homes as the girls mm -hmm. being and the modern day slavery and trafficking is still going on in a big way. So she's had to pivot and make that digital, but she's got some great volunteers um, who are giving their time, professional businessmen and women who are who are helping these girls, mentoring and coaching them. It's great to see. Yeah, but, it's been such a tough time for cha charities, isn't it? I think so. And, and I think the, the final proudest moment was back in, seems a long time ago now, 1985, when I um, set the, the world record for the Cyprus double mountain marathon, thing called a walkabout, not a walkabout at all. You ran up a mountain 6,000 foot high uh, with a team of three of you in little backpacks and kit through various checkpoints, uh, stayed overnight, and then you went in reverse order. It's when I was with the Scots Guards, and we mm. did it eight hours and nine minutes. I did it twice. I came, I think it was the third the, the first year I did it, and, and then we set the record the second year. And I oh, think wow. it's still unbroken but it's it's one of those special moments. I was young and virile and full of what do we 
<laughs> Can you still run that fast, Jonathan? Uh, no, I'm a, I'm a bit of a puddler now. I walk with, I, I run with my dog, Archie, and uh, my uh, working cocker. But uh, you asked about dark moments, Ben. I, I think um, some of the darkest moments were sadly to do with my separation and divorce some nine years ago and, and some of the financial hardship that has followed that, um, having to, to pay my ex-wife and keep her um, keep her in the style she, she um, needs to be in. And I, I found that's, that's got me quite down, quite suicidal at times, and I've had to battle those depressive thoughts. And uh, I sort of thought I was alone, but of course, in, in my job, I get to see many very successful people who are also going through um, depression or in some cases have mental breakdowns mm. or PTSD if they're army officers. A lot of the army officers know people or have had it themselves. Uh, through some of the horrors that they've seen and what they've had to serve for their country. So I think I found that very hard, that combination of um, the destruction of a, of a family unit, which is so very hard, um, and I wouldn't wish it on anybody, and also financial pressures at the same time, which which cause a lot of anxiety. Yeah, yeah, and I'm, I'm sure that's really... Uh, uh... <clears throat> something that's that's probably affecting a lot of people this this year um it's been tough for for, for a lot of people how, how have you sort of because it, it's quite difficult to 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 ask for help and be be honest in in the situation as you've described how how did you sort of get to the point where you actually sort of were were very open about about this because it, it takes a lot to get there yeah i, I think having um been coached sort of people who've been through difficult times and indeed some who've thought of taking their own life um i i always straight away if i'm their coach get them a therapist and and i just thought physician heal herself you know i've got to do what i would advise anybody else to do and i also think uh lee my wife has been incredibly understanding supportive and she said look get some you know get get some really good therapy and i found a good place i can recommend to anybody who's listening if they're hitting dark times, there's an organisation I know. I could uh, just drop me a note. I'll put you in touch with them, um, and and they have some outstanding therapists. Because I began by getting some therapists provided by the NHS for free, which is kind, but it's almost like they were practicing on me, and I I didn't have enough respect. They had to be really good and really experienced, and I and I felt that kind of thing. Um, I see yeah. we have we have a question from Sandy. Do you want to bring it on? Hmm. It's a long one, so we might have to. Uh, okay. Sandy <coughs> Duckett. Hi, Hi, Jonathan. Lovely to see you in such good health and spirits. Really interesting insights in overcoming adversity. Given the challenges we are all currently facing at the moment, what advice would you provide to attendees in providing leadership during 2021 and beyond? Yeah, great question, Sandy. And Sandy uh, really enjoyed working with him many years ago, actually, but I've been following his career ever since, and good luck, Sandy. Um, yeah, the, the point that some of the scientists I know, they say that we are now in the second quarter, not the second half of the impact of the pandemic and the recession that comes. And the recession will probably go on for five, 10 years, who knows? It'll impact different organizations in different ways. And so it, it's like, you've got to train as this is a triathlon, it's not a sprint. And so pacing yourself, Sandy, and um, as a leader, telling them what you do know and what you don't know and making use of bringing in um, a coalition of the willing, uh, as Phil Marshall Lynch, who I work for, would describe it when they went into any battle. They'd want to have those who are willing to be involved and have good people around you. If you've got any toxic people in your team, get them out early. Don't let them eat, eat up the... Um, eat up the culture of, of your team with, and, and make it psychologically unsafe. So train and develop them. But if they really are bad apples, get them out early and, and have a good team where you'll all look after each other. But do have some time to recover and discover like this Christmas where I'm going to take a, a well-earned break with Lee because we're both pretty tired. We've been on the go constantly throughout this year with some small breaks, but certainly no proper holidays. So it's not not what I would encourage anybody to do. And I wouldn't want to do it again. So yeah. Thanks, Sandy. Yeah, thanks, Sandy. And if any, anyone else has got got questions, please do put them up or comment. And and yeah, I think think that is great advice to to take time out. And and I think people almost get bogged down with the whole working from home. It's like yeah, you, and it spreads and it starts taking over your life. I know it's um it's done that to me a little bit 
over yeah. over this year. So take the time out when you need it. So you've spoken a lot about, about um, different things that have happened um, through your life and mistakes that you've made and, and times that you've learned. What's the sort of advice you'd like to have, have had when you were first sort of starting out or, or you would have given to yourself starting out? Oh, yeah, so much wisdom. I mean, I just, I almost daydream of going back to that time, knowing what I know now and all these different scenarios where I got it wrong and I could have been just so calm. I mean, the one thing that throughout my reports, even from someone as nice as Richard Downer, he said, John, just don't be so intense. Just have a bit more ease. And I think, and I want to apologize for anybody who was a peer of mine when I was in the army, that I, um, I was trying too hard. And I, I look after my own my own company of 140 men or whatever it is on my platoon, care for them dearly. Um, but I spent too much time looking for the sort of father figure upwards, trying to impress the commanding officer or a company commander if I was a platoon commander, and and not making friends and mates enough and relaxing and laughing more with my peers so that they trusted me and we helped each other out. We could do it together. I just single-mindedly was trying to be the best. And I think at times, um, please be less intense would be my advice to myself. And also be more present. We spend a lot of time worrying about what's happened and we can't change or agonizing about what's about to happen. Was it Mark Twain? He said, I, I, had, I had many difficulties in my life, 90% of which never happened. You know, I started time worrying about things that might happen and they never do. And and whenever it's difficult is to be as present as you can be, which is my mindfulness is so good. And the other one is that remembering that everybody you that everyone you meet has something to teach you. It's like saying that everybody else in the world is enlightened. If you imagine they're all enlightened, what can you learn from them? And so I I wish I'd known that and that that I do it now. I'm really interested in people's life stories and I ask everybody their life story. And so if you're a leader and you've got people who work for you, make time, 30 minutes to 45 to an hour. Ask them their life stories and how it shaped the person they are today and um, and, and what, what's, what's added to their values and the hardships and the highs and the lows. Because I do that now and it gives me such a connection with people. If only I'd done that when I was there, that trying to learn you might be even learning from people how not to do things like working for Baron Inge or Field Marshal Inge. He was very good in so many ways, but he was a fearsome, scary guy and in many ways frightened the bejesus out of most people. And a different way, I learned how not to do things. I'm not going to do that, but I will do what he did there. So, so I think that was some of the things that uh, I, I came up with. Yeah. 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 Okay. We've got we've had a couple more questions um, in the stream, so let's uh, let's bring a couple up. So, um, Catherine. Catherine. Yeah. Catherine. So, um, thanks, Catherine. So brave of you to talk about suicide. What can we do to encourage men to speak about their emotions? Yeah. Um, there is a problem with men um, that we don't tend to talk about our emotions. I remember there was going to be a coaching client that one of the organisations was giving me. They said he really needs help. He's just working too too hard. He's under great pressure, um, and, and they kept delaying me. We were about to start the coaching, kept delaying it. We're going to put you in touch with him. And then they just said, it's not happening. And I said, can I know why? And said, no. And I got in touch with the HR director uh, about six months ago. I said, by the way, what happened to that one about four years ago? He said, oh, he committed suicide. He, he set off the chainsaw in his garage, and he, he went into it and chucked himself up, and his son found him, his young son. And I thought, men, we just do things grim. We just, we either don't talk to anybody and then we do ghastly things to ourselves. Um, not all women talk to each other much, but they, they generally get things out, whereas we don't tend to. And that's why I'm more prepared to talk about mental health and the fact that I did consider taking my own life. Uh, luckily, I didn't because of Lee and, and my children, but it, it is something that men rarely talk about, just like it was very courageous of Dave Hudson to talk about PTSD, and, and he had four tours with the SES. Um, I, I think only the strong can be vulnerable, and I used to think that being vulnerable was weak, but actually I don't anymore, and I don't really care if people think I'm weak because I talk about the fact that I had depression or I thought about taking my life and committing suicide. I, I, I don't intend to now, um, but when you're in that place, it's just such a dark place, you're not thinking sensibly at all. It's just it all, you feel cornered in and there's no way out. 
and this is the only way that you can do it because you're so ashamed that you've got marital problems or financial problems or both as I had then. Um, so yeah, thank you, Catherine. Very kind of you to ask. And Jonathan Hurst. So with the event of remote working and the possibility that staff will never return to work on a regular basis, how would you recommend to engage with the team as we ha would have done in the office environment? Yeah, good, good question, Jonathan. And um, thank you for that. I, I do think the world of work will never be the same again. We're not going back, we're going forwards. And I think we're going to, um, we're going to find ways of using the office as a tool maybe once or twice a week where um, the boss can get people in. He might be, you know, standing in one area and they're in a round table with their laptops with some space between each other. Because it, this pandemic may be over, but there may be others coming down the line because we're so into, into bread, literally. All living cheek by jowl with too many domestic animals and all the problems of big processed farming that's going on and the cross species contamination. This won't be the only one. So I think we have to find different ways of working. There will be a hunger to go back to to lots of time together with people and things like that. But I just think it will be different. So as far as engaging with teams, I'm finding that um, really quite successful in finding ways on, on Zoom uh, to have engagement with teams, different techniques and things, which I'm happy to chat with you, Jonathan, separately about that will help teams build trust, build psychological safety, share some of their issues, and actually be, apart from the innovation and creativity, which is harder to get unless you're ready together, there's quite a lot you can do to be a lot more efficient without the travel uh, around the world. So I, I think we'll find we'll find ways. We always do. Humans are incredibly, incredibly adaptive. Uh, thank you for that. Yeah, definitely. And there's a, there's a comment, comment from Andrew um, Marvin about that subject area, and he, he says... Um, that uh, being focused on being present is is, is so much um, more important now, and I, I completely agree with him. He says don't don't be doing other things whilst you're on calls and on meetings. And I think it's a real temptation to be on a Zoom meeting or on a on a team meeting and, and be emailing or doing other stuff. And and actually, it's if you're on a meeting with people, be present, speak to them properly, and 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 you almost have to turn the energy up a little bit. We were talking to one of the people we interviewed. Jonathan was saying that you need to turn up the energy and, and, and actually yeah. sort of <laughs> project it a little bit. Yeah, I, I, I really like that one. And, and Andrew's got a really good point. I tend to encourage people not to have 30 minute meetings, but have 20 minute meetings, not to have an hour meeting, but have a 40 minute meeting with a five, 10 minute break. And so if we're doing something virtual, did something virtual with a team um, abroad um, in America and um, having like 40 minute sessions, five to 10 minute break, 40 minute session, five, 10 minute break, uh, and then longer breaks for, for people to get refreshments and food. Um, so that when you're present, you are present, you're in the moment and, and don't, don't have other devices going ping or off. And that great book by Nancy Klein, uh, the promise that I won't interrupt you. Um, and, and that is such a good read. If you, if you want one good life hack, uh, the promise by Nancy Klein, which is all about creating a thinking environment. And, and that is what I find really helps virtual teams massively uh, in mm -hmm. the current environment. Yeah, definitely. So um, just mo moving on. So so looking at um, some of the sort of values you live your, your, your life by. So, so um, what sort of moral values and virtues do you sort of aspire to live, 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 live your life by? Yeah, it, MQ or moral quotient values, integrity, it, it's the one that we all slip up on some stage and we have to get back, pick ourselves back up. And um, it, it really is so important. If people can't trust you, if you don't have psychological safety, you are really completely undermined. And I know over my life at times, I've got it wrong and broken trust with people. And I really regret that. Just I just agonize over it time and again when I, when I did things that weren't doing things right or doing the right thing rather than doing things right, sorry, doing, doing the right thing. Um, uh, and and I, I fall back on serve to lead, which is the, the motto in, uh, of army officers training in Santist. And, and as I mentioned, I was an instructor at Santist. And um, also I found uh, what has really helped me getting over my depression is stoicism. And it's not about being just hard. It's actually about controlling the controllables. What can you control? What's beyond your control? 
and you can control your thoughts and you can control your own actions. But I can't control your thoughts, Ben, or anybody else's. You can influence people, but only influence often by your own behavior. So people judge you by what you do, not what you say. And this is where politicians have come so unstuck. It's fine words, but then they find them behaving in a different way. Mm. But I haven't lived up to my values. I, I really have had to rethink and relook really at it. So a couple of examples of stories, I think, where um, I learned a lot on moral quotient. One was uh, I got a guy approached me. He was an investment banker. Turned out as he was sitting in my in my office in London, um, I thought, here we are, an army officer, a British army officer sitting with a former Russian army officer. I thought I never would have imagined when I was in electronic warfare spying on the Russians that I would actually be sitting with one of their officers who was an investment banker in London. But there we were. And he described what his bosses were like in the culture of this investment bank, which for reasons you'll understand will remain nameless uh, to, to protect the guilty. But he described a number of his bosses and peers. And, and I said, yeah, here's a list of their behaviors. And he looked through the list and went, yeah. He said, what is it? I said, it's called narcissism or white collar psychopaths. And he goes, right, okay. He said, can you coach me? I said, yeah, I'll coach you how to cope with them. And how no, 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 I want to be like them. I said, no way. I said, while I like your Yankee dollar, I will not coach you. I, I got somebody else for him who was prepared to work with people who uh, are a little bit more diverse than the ones I'm prepared to work with. But I just wasn't prepared to teach him. So, so yeah, if you're, if you're a psychopath, don't come to me. I'll, I'll draw a line. <laughs> but I won't help you because we can't change you, I'm afraid, as people try to change Trump and they cannot. Um, no, no. <laughs> yeah, I, I the other one was um, when I was uh, thinking about morals and values, when I was working for Field Marshal Lord Inge, or Baron Inge, as he's now called, uh, he was chief of the general staff. And I was in great fear and trepidation of working for this, this uh, phenomenal man. And uh, he chewed out the previous two aides-de-camps and both had got sacked for doing something wrong. And not only been sacked, but they'd been made redundant in options for change. So it wasn't just you lose your job, but you lose your career. So it's like, it's like First World War after, you know, go over the top and you might not last very long. I, I think the only reason I survived, I made quite a few blunders, and this was one of them, was that uh, if he'd fired three ADCs in a row, they probably would have gone, there's something wrong with you, General, rather than wrong with the ADC. So I think that's probably the reason I survived, because I wasn't very good at it. But anyway, I learned a lot, and we traveled the world, and we met fascinating people. Um, but anyway, on this one occasion, he said to me, um, if General Desmond Gordon rings and, and wants me to go to lunch at the club, whatever's happening, I must go. I mean, it has to be really important if I can't go. So right, sir. And I could tell this is the only person he seemed to be scared of. And, and he'd been the GOC of fourth division when Peter Andrew had been his ABC. So it's like my boss's boss in effect. Anyway, a couple of weeks went by, phone call. Hello. I go, hello, sir. Um, General Desmond Gordon here. Ah, oh, right, this is the one, right. Uh, hello, sir. Hello, sir. Yeah. <laughs> he said, how can I help? He said, uh, lunch, the club, Thursday. I said, I looked through the, the, the Chief General Staff's diary. I said, Terry, sorry, sir, he's with the Prime Minister. I, I thought that was a reason he couldn't go for lunch. Oh, OK. What about you then, young man? I said, uh, what do you mean, sir? He said, do you want to come and have lunch with me at the club? And I go, oh, that's very kind. Thank you, sir. And thanked him and put the phone down. And of course, I had the boss's diary, but I didn't have a diary because I had no life. I was just whatever I did was for him. And for whatever reason, I didn't write it in the diary. The day came. Nigel Hall, who I knew, who was a colonel, came in looking white. I said, Colonel, you're right. You look a bit scared and worried. He said, it's not me that should be scared and worried. It's you. I said, what do you mean? He said, I was at the club having lunch. And General Desmond Gordon said, oh, yeah, young boy, are you, are you Jonathan? Are we having lunch? No, sir, Nigel Hall. And he said, oh, I'm waiting for Jonathan. He's not here. I went, Oh my God, I'm going to have lunch. I am toast. I'm dead. That's like career ending. That's it. That's me. You know, out of the job, out of the army. I thought, and he, and he went, leaving me to, and literally cold sweat down my, my shirt was soaking. And I thought, I could lie. I could make up stories. And I thought, I can't, you know. A, it's not the right thing. And B, if he finds me, I'm still, I'll have my testicles removed and never live again. So I just thought, I'm going to have to face the truth. So I thought, what will I do? I must write an apology. So I wrote an apology letter, put it in the mail. Uh, and this was all very quickly. Then I thought I must ring him up and apologize. So I rang and I got his wife. Um, 
and and I and I said hello, and she said, hello. And I said I just got to be honest with you. I was supposed to have lunch with General. I can't reach him. It was the days before mobile phones, and didn't have a number of the club. And I said I completely forgot to have lunch. I, I'm very apologetic. She said, "Oh my dear, you are in trouble." <laughs> <laughs> and then I had to go in and face the the general. And he had this sort of big pile carpet. It was about the sort of, I don't know, it felt like a cricket pitch. It was right down the far end. And he made me wait in power play, he made me wait standing by the door. And I'd taken in some business cards. This was the eighth iteration of the business card. The font wasn't too right, it wasn't too high, too big. Anyway, we, we're now on the eighth edition. And these ones I think were right, and gold lettering and everything else. And he goes, yes, come. You know, we were close. And so I walked over to the table and I said, so your business card? And he goes, mm -mm. Check them. Oh, that's very good. Well done. Yeah, should have got it right first time though. Yes. And and I stood there, and he goes, "What is it?" I said, uh, um, "He goes, I've made a mistake, sir." He goes, "Well, it can't be that important unless it's business cards." And what was it? I uh, here he goes. I've got to have lunch with General Desmond Gordon, sir. Goes, oh my God! And I thought, oh my God, this is really bad. He said, "You must write to him." I've written to him, sir. You must ring him. I, I've, I've rung him. Just, just go away. It wasn't so hard. It was like, go away. So I slunk off out of the office. <laughs> I tried to keep a low profile for about a week while the storm blew over. Um, luckily, we didn't have to carry in the, the travel in the staff car. And I, I thought I got away with it. it sort of. I think it was that was that first warning, yellow card. And um, then I get this phone call. Hello? Hello, Hello sir. General Desmond Gordon here. <laughs> Lunch. The club, Wednesday. And I go, for the general, sir? No, for you. I said, all oh, right, sir. Uh, thank you very much. I, I won't forget. I know. <laughs> <laughs> he was wonderful. He was calm. He had gravitas. He had presence. He had stories from being a commanding officer in the, in the Second World War. He was just a fascinating guy. and became like the father figure, I hoped, the field, the field marshal might be, but he just didn't do that kind of thing because he didn't have a relationship with his own father. So he wasn't going to have a good relationship with me. It, just, it was a working relationship. But, but this guy was really special. And, and I think it was this, this thing about moral compass and integrity and his values that I learned from, uh, from Desmond Gordon, but also about when you're tempted to lie, not to lie, because it will find you out. And <laughs> on occasions when I haven't been truthful, it's always found me out. So yeah. now, if I get woken up by my wife in the middle of the night, I just tell her whatever it is, and, and it's the truth. Because there's no point trying to make stories up. You will get found out. Yeah. That's, cool. <laughs> That's a good story. <laughs> Very nice. I like that. Um, so with, um, with, with having that sort of that moral compass and those values, um, and, and I think that, uh, that the talking about some sort of dark times and coming out the other side is often good to have like a purpose in, 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 in life and, and, and meaning. So uh, it sounds like you've got, got a lot of purpose. What, 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 what gives your life purpose and meaning? Yeah, thanks, Ben. I mean, I, I really do feel every day that I'm living my life on purpose. And when I start to drift off purpose, then I try and bring myself back on purpose and really check in. And, and I think when I drifted through the army, I, I didn't really have a, a clear sense of purpose. I just thought become an army officer. My father's a naval officer. I'd be an army officer because I got seasick, so I'd do that. And I, I wasn't very good at flying and coordinating, so I couldn't be a pilot. So so the, the infantry, it worked for me. Firstly, the signals and the infantry. Um, but I, I'd, I'd been lucky in my early years because I was so keen and tense, perhaps. I tried really hard, I think, and, and got outstanding reports. And so I got sent to Santos to be a representative of the Royal Signals and be their platoon commander, a bit like Top Gun School, some describe it as, but uh, the army would scoff at that and just say, Santos is unique, there's nothing like it. And it is a very fine institution, I learned so much there. But I thought I was special, but I looked around, I had a very good friend, Rob Wayhill, who was there, and James Gatehouse, and another good friend, Lewis Bryant, who sadly was killed on a motorbike accident. It was the most tragic moment, and that was a dark moment. He was a really good friend a logistic par parachute regiment officer who, who became a power officer and, and died on the motorbike. I was the last to see him alive. And I, I said to him, take it easy on that bike. It's a beast. And in uh, Windsor Great Park, he was racing someone, another biker slid on an oil patch, came off and went into another vehicle and was was killed in a, in a gruesome way. Um, 
So I got my report that year and, and I was average in comparison to these other officers and they were far better than me. And it was a crisis of confidence and competence. I, I wasn't that good. And I'd, I, I didn't know really about the infantry skills that that was what Santos was about. I'd been a Royal Signals officer and, and I hadn't really learned the skills as well. And, and people like Rob Wayhill, was out, they were outstanding. I learned a lot from him. He shared stuff with me and taught me a lot. And so I, I had a crisis. I'd like, okay, so I, I can't lead. I'm not really good at leadership in comparison to these guys. How do they do it? And I'm still in touch with the Sanders. We had a reunion, all the Louts Club. Uh, we were described as Louts because when we got drunk, we behaved badly and we had a reunion. And they've all done different things. And not all gone on to great things, all done different things in life, but quite special people and training and development was our big thing. So I reached out to the Fleet Air Arm Officers Association and I said, um, anybody knew Commander Paul Perks killed in 1964 in Changi? Would they write to his son, Jonathan, who wants to know more about the man he never knew because he was too young when he was killed? I got lovely letters from all over the, all over the world. And I invited those who were near Santa's to come and have lunch. We're having lunch, and there was Roger sitting opposite me, and uh, Wing Commander, uh, no, uh, Commander Bill White, Navy, Naval Commander, to my right. And Roger said to me, um, after a few glasses of Merlot, he said, Jonathan, your father bought my ticket. I said, what do you mean? He said, your father died in my aeroplane. He should be here having lunch with his son, and I should be dead. And I said, how long have you carried that thought for? He said, 30 years. 30 years i said well whatever it's worth as, as his son i release you from any obligation it was as a leader that was his that was his decision he made that call from what i understand from all who were there to test the aircraft the buccaneer mark one which was under power and had faults to make sure it was safe for you he was the commanding officer you were his young pilots and he tested them all and bill white to, to my right said that is the case he said john if you remember seeing the film top gun where goose is killed being ejected out of the, the airplane at the tailpiece and he gets killed and his limp body is, comes out of a parachute. And that's what happened. He blew the canopy off. He got me out as his op observer. I lived. It's the second time I ejected and he said, it doesn't have shorten your spine. He said, but he was at 200 miles an hour into the tailpiece and it killed him. And that's when his body was washed up, which is when, if you remember the story at the beginning, when the naval officer, the casualty visiting officer came to our caravan door and knocked on the door to tell my mother that her husband had been killed. And um, Bill White said, you have a choice, Jonathan. He said, you can be a victim, poor me. You never had a dad. Mum brought up three boys from the age of 35. You never had much money. Poor me, I'm a victim. It's because I haven't got a dad that everything's gone wrong for me. And quite a few things in my life have gone wrong. But he said, oh, you can choose to make your father your inspiration and your mother. Mm. Who has that much money, does a lot of philanthropy. You can make her an inspiration to you, which is why Lee's work with the charity is why I'm so supportive of that. And, and, and really that was the moment that I decided to look for inspiring leaders, learn from them, and which is why you and I are doing this series and why I've written the books and why I coach people and their teams to mm. help inspire them. And, 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 and he's, he gave me this quote. He said, Mark Twain once said, Jonathan, there are the two most important days in your life the day you were born and the day you found out why and today could be why mm. jesus that must have been some lunch <laughs> well, it, it was sorry it, it just got me there it, yeah, it, yeah. Well, it was a seminal moment in my life but you joined mm. the dot afterwards looking back on your life as as um you know, the apple ceo uh, said um looking back that not at the time did I realize how seminal that moment, Steve Jobs, that was who I was mm. remembering. It, it, it's, you look back now, that was a key point for me. I stayed on the army some time after that, but I was, I had a different attitude and staff college and things like that. But, but then going out into learning about leadership, learning from leaders, mm. I've never stopped doing it and I'll be learning till the day I die. Yeah, yeah, that must be, I mean, to have 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 that sort of said about your your father, who who you, who has probably been on your mind all that 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 time, um, and such a strong um, thing to be said about your father. You must be like, heart must have just um, almost yeah. uh, like, it, was, 
Yeah. It, it was like a, a physical punch in the chest. Yeah, yeah. And what, what, a, what a, a, a sort of legacy to live up to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, and lovely letters from these people, you know. Yeah. Your father, I remember him teaching me to fly, and we made little vapor trails in the sky, and, and I, I could see how I was trying to follow him, and others who said he, he used to fly so low that their job was to deliver the nuclear bomb uh, against the Russian fleet, the Kiev-class destroyer and all the fleet around it. And they'd fly so low, they were telling me, that, that they'd be sucking up seawater into the jet engines if they weren't careful. And he'd always go lower, lower. And they'd be following him. And he'd be so low. Because they had to be under the radar. Right, and right. Island or a, a small rocky outcrop in the sea, they'd flip over on their back and then back again just to stop, yeah. pushed up by the, the upwash from the island. Uh, it just is some crazy stuff, crazy stuff. Jesus. And so many of his intake at Dartmouth never lived on. They, really? they all, well, because landing on an aircraft carrier in a in a stormy sea, they yeah. had a a, a, a a tennis court size patch of the aircraft carrier to land on. Yeah, and yeah. If they missed it, there was no in the early days. There was no hook and wire. They'd go over the end, and the aircraft carrier would sail over them. And the yeah. air, the, the buccaneer was so heavy, it would just sink. And and so if they didn't get out of the cockpit, they were dead. Yeah. Um, and often in, in really cold seas, so not much chance for them. Yeah, Jesus, that's that's a tough job. <laughs> so um, and, and it, it sounds like uh, that those sort of formative moments must have been, been taking away huge sort of learnings and, 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 and giving you that sort of resilience over, over time. Um, do you have like a piece of wisdom that you, 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 you live by that, that, have, that has come, come from, from any of those learnings? Yeah, I mean, so many uh, tips. I, th I think the thing is, uh, th this point, I, I think one of the things is to learn from this about health and well-being, and um, particularly physical health and mental health, which gets you through many difficult situations. So uh, particularly those who, who are finding COVID-19 and lockdown hard and the recession hard, as I am finding it tough. Um, so I, I think... I've learned to have, as probably for my military days, have a, a routine, the bookends of the day, the morning and the evening are the two bits of the day you can control the most. Uh, during the day, you, you lose control of what goes on, but the, the beginning is the end. And so I think military discipline and that book, Atomic Habits by James Cleal, I find very good. Uh, and the physical training, um, even from the days when I did airborne training with Dave Hudson, who went on to do SES um, selection and get through and serve with them four times. Uh, whenever I'm training, even now as I approach 60, um, I think, what would Dave be doing? And I know even now he'd, he'd be pushing out the burpees or whatever it is. So it pushes me harder. And and I think also the tips I've learned about mental health is the importance of journaling and uh, mindfulness, you know, really getting yourself in the present moment and doing some breathing, some focusing. Uh, and the Daily Stoic, which I, I read every day rather than the news, which depresses me. I, I'll look at things which are, are uplifting. So I found health and well-being has, has taken me through some some, some tough times. And, and however old I'm going to be, I don't know how long my life's going to be. My life, my father's life was just 35 years, but he lived his whole life. It's just he didn't know it was 35. Um, I don't know whether mine is 59 or 60 or 61 years, or whether hopefully it'll be longer. I'd like to live the hundred-year life, but I don't know what's planned for me. Um, I'll do my best, but some things are out of my control. Yeah, yeah. And with um, with your current or career choice and, and, and what do you do now, um, uh, emotional intelligence is, is so important. And you have, um, I've sort of experienced the great sort of rapport you have with people and um, and and the, the the great sort of connections you have um, that you've brought both on this show and and uh, um, and the stories you've told me. How have you sort of developed that over over time? Yeah, well, thanks for that, man. Um... I, I think the first thing is I, I'm constantly studying people. I'm really interested in human behavior. Uh, I, I think in a way uh, the the marital challenges I had in my first marriage and I wanted to make it work uh, and I wasn't getting it right. So I studied a lot about human psychology to try and help my own relationship. Um, and um, in the process got interested in coaching, which about 20 years ago we didn't have coaching. Um, and this idea of really listening to people to understand and and generative attention that you give people and their stories and and and, and some great questions. And so I've spent my time, I think, 
really making emotional intelligence if i was dyslexic and, and perhaps some aspects would be closed off to me in the mathematical side of dyslexic with math spelling and, and, and english and writing which is a bit of a challenge but um i, I found that learning about people and picking up uh, somatically what's what's going on in people and just asking that question are you okay and they'd go yeah, yeah i'm fine and i go I'm, I'm not really picking up that you are fine. What, what's happening? And they'd open up. So I think I learned a lot of that from my mother. She was very good at that. She had to be mother and father for the three of us. And uh, Graham went on to do uh, surgery. Dave went on to be an artist, but he, he also did most drugs known to man. And so that was quite difficult for a mother to have a son who was was uh, addicted to drugs. And But he's come through that, but it was a very difficult time. And so she had to read us as best she could. And, and I think doing deep research, and also, uh, Ben, I think I'm an early adopter, my wife describes me as. So as soon as there's something I've read about, I'll go and practice it. I, I literally, the first person off a course, I'll be putting it into practice with my clients and having these teachable moments. So if it doesn't work, it's a teachable moment. So it's either succeeded and I've learned something, or it's 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 a learning, it's a, a, it's a teachable learning moment. So what have I learned? What am I going to do differently? That, that's that's why I, I just keep watching people learning about deep listening, Nancy Klein's book on uh, thinking environment, all this kind of stuff. It, it's a great skill, a, a life skill that must be developed and not many people really develop it enough. Yeah, yeah. I really appreciate the, the, the time that we've spent spent together, um, uh, particularly doing these interviews and, and, and interviewing such a diverse um, a group of people over over the time with really different experiences and um, from from army army officers to astronauts to olympians um it's been it's been great to sort of just get different people's experiences what's formed them and and, and the different pieces of advice that have, have, have that's come out of that it's been been really nice yeah. um and it sounds sounds like you obviously like uh, like like most people you've you've had some some tough times some some good times some 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 low times and uh and, and through sort of learning through those um where have you sort of found that resilience um to and what have you learned from it yeah so i mean i think resilience i'm very lucky that i have uh lee as a, a great advisor to me and, and oliver as well oliver johnson a friend of mine so we do thinking around time with each other but when i when I hit difficult times and, and I needed additional help, I did actually, as I say, seek therapy, found a very good therapist. She's outstanding, would recommend her to anybody. Um, and, and, I, and I found that helped me through the depression and the, and the suicidal thoughts. Um, and also I found the long distance endurance athlete side and doing the airborne training in parachute training uh, with the British Army, they do like to, in those days, beast you or put you in a ring to mill with a six foot four um, beast of a soldier who hates officers and they deliberately put him with me uh, and I just had to stay in the ring and stay alive uh, I think I'm probably a bit stupid because of that I'm sure a lot of brain cells were knocked out that particular day but I did survive uh, and I think that endurance and that stamina to keep going uh, I remember doing uh, the, the first day of the, the Cyprus double mountain marathon when when as I say we we set the record and I was tempted to walk as I was going up the hill and the two guys behind me wanted to walk. So they started walking. So I thought, oh, no, I'll give up, I'll just walk. And then I sort of imagined my father sitting there you know, on his cloud going, really, Jonathan, you're going to walk? So you don't want to win then? And I went, no, no, I want to win. He said, well, winners don't walk. And I went, okay. And I don't know, I probably was nuts. I probably was hallucinating at that stage. It was Cyprus heat. <laughs> I grabbed him by the front of the shirt and said, we're bloody running. And like, okay, okay, we'll run. And of course, that made the difference. Just a few minutes mm -hmm. the lead on the first day. Um, so I think researching what what makes resilient people and how people bounce back, and also lowering your your threshold for stress, so you pick it up early. Some people think they they got to have a very high threshold for stress, and they just keep going, and then they fall over. They literally have a breakdown. Mm -hmm. They're not picking up the signals. So actually, you don't want it to set too high. Don't set the threshold too high because you're not listening to yourself and taking time out and when I get exhausted, Lee will know, I just might, might look like a, my puppy dog, Archie, you know, his tail will go down, his ears will go down, he's tired. So you just, I, I have power naps, always have, um, I do 10 minutes worth of mindfulness and I let that drift into 20 minutes worth of sleep. 
and I always have 20 minutes of sleep now, religiously digging out working from home. And it gives me the boost for the later mm. part of the day when I go to work. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what gives me the resilience. And family and friends. And yeah. And health bit right because if you if you overdo your resilience it'll affect your health and if you don't look up to your health it'll affect your resilience so so those two components of the inspiring leadership compass are closely. yeah yeah got a nice comment from um nick bannerman um who says inspiring as ever to hear from you jonathan met you on a london train around nine years ago and although i'm a grumpy scotsman who doesn't <laughs> engage while traveling you got through my armor and made a really positive impression on me then and ever since yeah, thanks, thanks Nick. Nick. That's a good, good comment. If anybody's got any final sort of questions for Jonathan, we've got a, a couple more minutes, so so um, just uh, fire them over. But um, just sort of looking at um, how you sort of learn from mistakes, and you you've often sort of said to me that the getting um, feedback and getting that three hundred and sixty feedback is, is is massively important. Could could you speak more about about sort of how that's helped you and what yeah. you learned? Thanks, Ben. A really great believer in 360 feedback uh, from a whole range of people, about 20 people. I do this a lot with the, the CEOs I work with, getting feedback on them, because they often live in this bubble of thinking they're fine, the echo chamber that, like Trump does, think he's wonderful, won't listen to any feedback that's negative. Um, and, and so um, I value difference, and, and people aren't wrong, they're just different from me. And so learning about diversity inclusion is a very big thing for me. Um, and the, also the importance of sound judgment. I had a habit of blurting when I was an army officer. If I had a sort of good idea, I blurted. In fact, I was going to write a, a, a little small pamphlet book called The Army Needs More Maverick Officers. And Richard Janet persuaded me that if I wanted a career in the army, I shouldn't write the book. And uh, I didn't actually write it. I had all the cartoons. I had all the stuff worked out, but I didn't write it. Um, and I think that was the thing when I was in the army that I, um, I learned from 360. And looking back at reports when I left the army, you can ask for all your reports. And I found that one or two people put the old stiletto and didn't say to me at the time, but they questioned my judgment in my military judgment, which actually goes to show that I probably for my 20 years was an okay army officer, but I, I could have been really good. But mm. what is so nice in the last 20 years in, in business and in coaching and leadership work is people value my judgment and my wisdom, which I've accumulated from the mistakes of not having good judgment and not having good wisdom when I was in a different profession. And so I think that's what I've learned and, and always looking for feedback and feed forward and having courageous conversations. Those, those are really important. Okay, final, final question, Jonathan. What would you like your legacy to be? Yeah, I think when I'm dead, that when people think of me, um, they'll smile. Um, and that my legacy is my daughters, uh, Harriet and Brani, and my stepson, Daniel, and my stepdaughter, Alana. Uh, my wife, Lee, who I, I hope I go before she does, and the charity that she set up for vulnerable girls uh, around the world who are suffering from modern-day slavery, trafficking, and abuse. And to be able to, to leave the clients I've worked with as more inspiring leaders than I found them, if they found that they and their teams are more inspirational and better at what they do, then job done. Brilliant. Well, Jonathan, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and uh, getting the chance to interview you and learn lots more about your journey and all the lessons that you've learned along the way. Um, thanks for everyone that's um, been watching. As we said, this has been uh, the last one of the, the Inspiring Leadership um, series, which is going to be going out live. But um, Jonathan will be carrying on doing his um, his podcast and, and, and posting up videos um, pretty regularly, pretty much every every week or even, even twice a week sometimes. So that, And there's some great great stuff on there so please do um, go and check it out and thank you very much and wishing you every success in amazon web service they're very lucky to have snapped you up and i'm sure you'll be very successful and uh, real pleasure to work with you on this series thank you oh, thank you mate take care